it's a, a very interesting meeting, and I'm glad to have a, a small part on it. And I knew since I was the first up that it would be good to at least have a, ha have a map. In fact, I'll have more than one map, but to help us uh, focus on where we are. But you really don't have to, if you know anything about Washington, D.C., um, you can just walk out and hail a cab and uh, learn a whole lot about Ethiopia. Most, uh, at least from my experience in Washington, D.C., most of the cab drivers are from Ethiopia. There's very large Ethiopian communities uh, in the area, uh, to a lesser extent from the other countries, uh, but very large presence. I, there's My wife and I had a, um, what was it? A, I can't remember which anniversary, but an anniversary dinner at an Ethiopian restaurant here in the Georgetown. Uh, so, you, you know, you can uh, learn quite a bit uh, from these folks, and, and you do learn from them of why, they've, why they're here and not there. Uh, you know, the conflicts, some of which we've mentioned, um, but I, I won't talk about that uh, a lot today. So I thought I'd uh, begin with just a, a little bit of a presentation so you can see population, and, and uh, I apologize if it's a little small, but uh, this, these are ranked by size of population. So Ethiopia has 83 million people, uh, and you know that's you know well you know that's the giant in the room. So uh, Somalia has uh, less than 10 million people, uh, Eritrea 5 million, and Djibouti around a million or uh, a bit less. So really, when you talk about this set of countries, there is an elephant in the room, as they say, and, and that is Ethiopia. Um, and you, and uh, the uh, w maybe one surprising, just from the basic demographics, is the country with the highest annual population growth rate has been Eritrea uh, and uh, not Ethiopia. And there are some different, and that's a bit surprising, uh, given that they're a predominantly Christian country, not, you know, it's, uh, it's split, um, but that it's not true from research that Muslims always have more kids than uh, Christians. That tends to be the case, but it tends to be associated with uh, economic development. Uh, and then, the, of course, the richest on a per capita basis is Djibouti uh, at uh, looking at their uh, GDP per capita, it's not a rich country, but relative to the others, more than double the annual uh, income, so uh, that's that's a place where that's a bit better off uh, than the rest. Life expectancy uh, is, of course, the lowest in Somalia uh, at about 50, uh, low 50 years, uh, and then higher in Eritrea, Ethiopia, and uh, 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 Djibouti, but still all below, far below Western standards, which indicates a lot about the economic and, and development. And, and life expectancy is often pulled down by infant mortality, so that's, that's a factor. So the, as health uh, improves in those life expectancy, health, uh, more medical attention for women uh, is given at, at birth in prenatal care and postnatal care, then the, those statistics are expected to rise. Um, and literacy is quite high. In, in all three countries. Well, looking at another map, this is a map that uh, uh, at Boston University's uh, uh, Cura, our project, we have a demographic project, and we put together a map looking at the Christian to Muslim ratio uh, in uh, across Africa, and you can see on the horn in Somalia there's really no Christians. Uh, in Somalia, uh, and those that are there are hidden. Uh, the Muslim majority extends down into Kenya. Uh, of course, Ethiopia has uh, large Muslim communities in certain parts of the country, though Muslims live throughout. But the ratio is very high uh, along where uh, the border where, with Somalia. And then, uh, of course, Djibouti has Muslims, and Eritrea has uh, a, a higher Christian um, concentration. Well, this map really hides something that I think is interesting, and that's this map. The largest Muslim population in the region is, are Ethiopians. So even though they make up, uh, well, there's a dispute about that, but may, perhaps at least a third of the population, uh, they have the largest Muslim population uh, by more than double the, the others. So uh, Ethiopia and its Muslim population needs to be understood as a, as a major uh, force within that region. 
Uh, now, just a, a, a few statistics which hide the diversity, but uh, Ethiopia, as I mentioned, is about a third, uh, a bit over a third Muslim. And at least from, a, the, I base that on, uh, you know, analysis of different kinds of demographic and health surveys, census statistics, uh, and other surveys in the country. But th that number is actually disputed. Uh, many people say that, I mean, you can read things on the internet if you can trust things you Google, that uh, Ethiopia is even a Muslim-majority country now. So, uh, But at least by the best uh, s social science data, which is, has its limitations, um, you know, we're we're still putting the Muslim population at, at you know, a, a, a little over a third of the population. Um, and of course, that may be changing in the future. Uh, Somalia uh, is, uh, we tried to find uh, part of the projects that we do are, are trying to identify Christian denominations and not just uh, surveys of population, but even identifying churches and how many members churches claim in uh, countries. And even by looking at that measure, we find almost no Christians in Somalia. So most uh, those who are active and, and uh, have been open about their faith, uh, you know, we, we see signs of uh, beheadings and, uh, and, you know, extreme measures taken to have them either renounce their faith or leave the country, which uh, many have. Eritrea, again, is, uh, has a very similar uh, population as uh, Ethiopia. Again, about a little over a third Muslim, but majority Christian. And uh, I'll talk about religious freedom in Eritrea in a little bit later. And uh, Tim may be, uh, will you be discussing religious freedom in these countries a bit? Or So uh, I'll try not to be too re redundant. And then Djibouti is, uh, again, um, by and large, a, a Muslim majority country, very small populations of other faith groups. Uh, now, uh, just on religious freedom, I'll have to explain this chart a little bit. You don't have to understand it fully, but these are two measures that I developed at Penn State University and then published quite regularly at, at the Pew Research Center. These are, <coughs> coming across the page, are government restrictions on religion. So this includes everything from uh, prohibiting proselytism, proselytism and conversion, to limits on religious broadcasting, uh, government force use against religious groups, you know, a whole battery of things that governments can do to control or restrict religion or religious freedom broadly defined. So the further your dot is as a country this way, the higher the government restrictions. And then the higher you go up the scale is the higher levels of uh, social hostilities involving religion. And these include everything from religiously banned biased hate crimes, uh, to sectarian violence, mob violence, uh, all the way to religion-related war. Uh, so the higher you are going up the scale, then the, the higher uh, levels of social hostilities. And in general, you can see that up here there's very few countries, down here there's very few countries. Those two t tend to work in tandem. You know, you know that as one goes up, the other goes up. And, and I have a book uh, mentioned in the whole biography for how that works. Uh, so Ethiopia is the um, red dot right here, and this is where the median is for all countries. So Ethiopia is far above on both measures, both uh, social hostilities and government restrictions on religion. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that at the end uh, of my short presentation. Whoa, Somalia Whoa. is uh, where you would expect it to be. Uh, about as far almost off the chart as you can get on both measures. And this is taking into account uh, the de facto government, uh, when, whoever's in charge in a particular region, is how that was coded, and social hostility. So Somalia certainly, uh, every dot are the 198 countries studied, so Somalia is uh, as bad of a situation as you can get. Um, Eritrea is uh, the only country, I, I, some State Department people correct me if I'm wrong, the only country that the, the International Religious Freedom Act, it's authorization of sanctions based on violations of religious freedom, Ethiopia, uh, Eritrea is the only country ever sanctioned under that act by the U.S. government. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm, 
and nobody corrects me. I think solely. Solely. Sol 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 because of the, the, the <coughs> And it's interesting, uh, Eritrea has extremely high government restrictions on religion. And as you can see, there's very few countries in this, in this area. China is here. This is China. So it's got government restrictions on religion equal to China. Uh, but its use of force is has so severe that uh, that you don't get any social hostilities. The government has, has just suppressed. So really, when you're here, you can say, well, look look how good these policies are. They're keeping down all social hostilities. The, the price of that is is uh, the severe repression of, of population on this topic. Uh, and then uh, Djibouti um, again higher government restrictions, very uh, relatively low social hostilities involved in religion. Uh, now, I, I want to finish um, with two other pieces of data. This is a survey that when I was at the Pew Research Center we conducted uh, on uh, religion in sub-Saharan Africa. And we were only able to do, carry out surveys in Ethiopia and Djibouti. Uh, Eritrea uh, didn't permit them and Somalia uh, was an impossible place to survey. So uh, just to give you a flavor of religious attitudes in these uh, countries, uh, Ethiopia, uh, one question we ask, how important is religion in your life? And less than 1% said it's not important at all. Uh, and the vast majority of people, the dark blue, 79% of people said it's very important uh, to me. And if you look at Djibouti, it's uh, a, a bit similar. Instead of 79%, uh, it goes up to 86%, uh, uh, religion being very important. And I, these are very consistent findings across much of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, perhaps the only country where you'll find lower numbers is South Africa, in the, uh, the country of South Africa. Uh, so religion's highly important. Uh, in addition, uh, people were very active. So in Ethiopia, remember, majority Christian, but this reflects uh, Muslim activity as well. This is the general population. How often do you pray? Uh, and uh, one out of three people pray several times a day, and uh, not, not, not just once a day. So more, you know, the majority of the population are praying once a day, uh, at least uh, self-reported. And in Djibouti, that shoots up to 76% of people uh, praying. And of course, that's part of the rhythm of life in Djibouti with the calls to prayer. And, and so the, the, the social situation uh, encourages you know, prayer multiple times a day. But still, both, both countries uh, very very religiously active. Uh, and then how often do you attend religious services? Uh, more than once a week is, <clears throat> and once a week, uh, almost everybody in Ethiopia is uh, going to religious service, and the same in Djibouti. Again, the high number more than once a week would be um, because of you know the daily uh, attending the mosque on a daily basis. Uh, now, this will be the last little section of my uh, comments. Uh, these are the, uh, again focusing on the gorilla or the elephant or the big big player in the in the horn Ethiopia um, tracking uh, government restrictions on religion in Ethiopia we've seen a steady increase in uh, government activities to try to control religion and, and some of that is related uh, not only to the dispute within Christianity um, but uh, the growing concern in Ethiopia of uh, radicalization. So <clears throat> we've seen that rising trend. And then uh, I'll, I'll bring this back around. I'm, I'm going to comment on that from a, an, an, uh, maybe for all of you a, uh, an, a surprising angle. But I, I'll look at how this might relate to business outcomes. And, uh, and one of the th areas of research that I'm working on uh, daily is looking at how um, religious freedom is related to economic outcomes. And one of the things that we find is that innovative strength is more than twice as likely in countries with low uh, religious restrictions compared to high government restrictions. So where you start 
and you could, in economic terms, highly regulating or even over-regulating the religious market, um, that may be a window into how the government's regulating many other things as well. Uh, and, and that, you know, higher regulations can tamp down innovation. So are there any indications that this might be happening in Ethiopia? These are statistics from the World Economic uh, Forum's Global Competitive in Index, and these are the percentage of countries stronger than e Ethiopia in global competitiveness. And so their global competitiveness rank has been declining uh, each year. Uh, the same, well, this goes up a little bit more, newer than the Pew data, but there's some, uh, some tracking uh, with, with some of the religious restrictions. And then Ethiopia scores very low in strength of investor protection. So uh, in terms of other countries uh, that we might want to compare it to, um, the investor protections are very strong, which is a, another sign of, a, a, of, you know, governments regulating the, the country in one way, but perhaps not providing providing protections, and those are the same protections that I that sometimes when you're protecting the diversity of investors, so new investors, newcomers to the market, uh, same with religion, you may not be thinking of protecting the the newcomer. Well, those are the um, uh, that's sort of a, a complete tangent from what anybody might want to talk about, but at least I, I certainly see these connections. And uh, I'll just conclude uh, just mentioning the connections with the UK, and, and I, I appreciate this chance for the cross, uh, cross the Atlantic dialogue. I'll be there next, uh, next month in the UK f uh, and Europe for about a month. Part of it is with the Westminster Dialogue on Faith. Uh, I'll be participating in that. And then at the House of Lords, we'll be having a meeting with top CEOs from London to discuss a counter-radicalization, what do you call it, State Department, CVE uh, initiative, um, to uh, do a pilot project in London where we get business people to volunteer to build relationships with people in at-risk communities with a toolkit of uh, resources that they can help that person find a job, get an education, know how to better, you know, even put a resume together. Uh, but it's that personal relationship <clears throat> tied to social impact investment. So then that this group at the House of Lords on February 19th will be discussing that. So if there's any, I know a number of people are interested in that topic, and I'd be glad to, you know, have side conversations on that as well. So uh, I'll stop there, and maybe you suggested a, a question or two. Um, the issue of government regulations of the religious sphere versus business. How would your equations factor China, where restrictions on the religious forms is quite substantial per your data, but that innovation and business growth is phenomenal? Yeah. Well, one of the things China, I've given a talk called the yin, yin and yang of religious freedom in China. So there's tremendous religious freedom in China if you're the right kind of religion. Um, and if you're not, then you have a tougher time, and that often depends on the area. Uh, that's that's one, one thing. So China has really taken the boot off of religious freedom. <clears throat> I mean, taken the boot, one boot off of religious freedom, and or off of religion, and they've allowed a lot of religious activity to the point that China went from zero religious activity during the Cultural Revolution to now being the second largest religious population in the world after India. So there, there's been, there has been de facto religious freedom, and, and a lot of that is, you know, if they hadn't given at least that much, there'd be large segments of the economy and people who wouldn't participate. How do you define um, social hostility? What's the detail of, of that? So social hostilities involving religion are have 13 different types of hostilities. So there's religiously biased hate crimes uh, of any sort, uh, mob violence uh, triggered or involving religion, religion-related terrorism uh, motivated by faith or targeting religious groups, religion-related war, uh, so uh, where the other side is identified by uh, faith, at least to some degree. And then other measures such as whether or not women are harassed, are harassed because of 
their dress, whether or not there are movements within the country seeking to dominate the public life with one perspective on religion to the exclusion of others, um, and uh, whether or not there's any backlash by uh, the majority faith towards minority faiths to try to keep them out. Um, so those are, the, that's all the different things that goes into that measure.